Good evening, and welcome to Buffalo State and our wonderful Birchfield Penny Art Center. I'm pleased to bring you greetings tonight from our president, Aaron Podolewski, who unfortunately was unable to be with us, but he wants to send his regards to everyone that's here. My name is Suzanne Baer, and I'm the vice president for institutional advancement at Buffalo State. And tonight, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our presenter, Mr. Bill Cleary. He has a dynamic program planned for you this evening in which he will share marketing insight from, one, from some of the world's most recognizable and innovative brands, chief among those, Apple. I met Bill for the first time less than two weeks ago in California, and let me tell you, all of you are in for a treat tonight. Bill is a proud two-time graduate of Buffalo State with a bachelor's and bachelor's and bachelor, excuse me, it's been a long day, I guess, I apologize bachelor's and master's degree in secondary education. During our visit, he told me a story of his time at Buffalo State and how he honed his entrepreneurial skills by renting one of the mansions in Buffalo. He paid $250 a month and he rented to 12 students at $50 a month, so you do the math. You can tell at a very early, t very early age he was entrepreneurial. And I know that we have a lot of entrepreneurs with us tonight, um, and I want to thank you for being here and thank Sue McCarthy and the SBDC for all of your good work. After graduating from Buffalo State, Bill remained in Western New York and taught at Lakeshore High School from 1972 to 1978. And I believe a few of Bill's former colleagues are here tonight. Thank you all for joining us. I know we have one. Can you at least raise? Thank you. We're glad that you're here. <laughs> I think that happens later tonight. <laughs> I also want to recognize our strong alumni contingent that's in attendance tonight. We welcome all of you. And there are about 200 students that you cannot see that are upstairs, and I know um, we can't see them, they can see us. So we're very glad that they're here tonight, and I want you to know that during the Q&A at the end, we would like for students that have questions to please come down to the auditorium so that you can ask those questions. I'm sorry that the auditorium is, was filled, but we're so glad that everyone's here, so please do come down. To continue, in 1978, Bill shifted his career focus to business, and he moved to New York City to work as an advertising firm copywriter. He contributed to the marketing of popular brands such as Pepsi, where, he's wor where he worked on the wildly successful marketing campaign, the Pepsi Challenge, before being recruited to join Apple Computer in Cupertino, California in 1981. As consumer marketing manager at Apple Computer in the 1980s, Bill helped launch the company's groundbreaking Apple E and C products. He later co-founded CKS Group, one of the Silicon Valley's most technologically savvy advertising agencies, CKS was instrumental in launching several major brand web sites, including Amazon, eBay, and Yahoo. Today, Bill is the owner of Cleary & Partners, a California-based strategic marketing, branding, and technology services firm. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. Bill Cleary. Thanks again so much. I appreciate it. I see some of the teachers from Lakeshore, they probably thought I was in the witness protection program, but it was actually, I was actually living in California. By a show of hands, how many of you folks are, consider yourselves would-be entrepreneurs so we can gear this? Hey, we got a good group tonight. How many of you also use an Apple product of some kind? I'm gonna come around here so I can see. Some like an iPhone or one of these, like these iPads. And, okay, so we have a, you're, you're gonna be real receptive to the messages I have tonight. Um, you know, because, you know, essentially this is what I've been doing for the last bunch of years. Actually, my friend Gus Phillips here, Gus, could you show, he's been real helpful in getting my, <laughs> getting my presentation organized for me and showing up tonight. A lot of these teachers came in from Angola, and I want to just say to those folks, can I, I can't even see, who's up in the, up in the upstairs here? People in the back there? Thank you for coming. I think it's great that you guys showed up, even though we didn't have enough seats. Uh, next time I come, we'll have to get a bigger venue, that's all. Um, okay, let me start out by saying a little bit about um, my background. I was a teacher, that's correct. I was a teacher at Lakeshore. I came to Buffalo State. I'm originally from Long Island, 
where uh, my primary interest was the game of lacrosse. Um, but then eventually I got serious about stuff and I said, I'm going to need to find a job and there's no professional teams in lacrosse, so I'll have to get serious. And I really wanted to be a history teacher. So I came to Buff State and I, I, did, I, I took some of the courses in anthropology at the University of Buffalo, but I took most of my classes here. I got a bachelor's, finished my bachelor's, went to school for two years in New York down in Long Island, and I got my <coughs> master's degree here. And then I went on to a job and the teachers will corroborate my story. Wasn't I a teacher? I was. I was a teacher. See, I'm not kidding. I'm not making this stuff up. So basically, I wanted to talk tonight about how Apple and my old uh, colleague Steve Jobs uh, really impacted marketing in so many ways. And we're going to have some things that might be a little bit kludgy here. We're going to have to get up on the internet and take a look at some old commercials. But we'll start by saying my background in terms of some of the technology companies I work for, uh, you know, so some of the great ones actually, because if you look at Mr. Jobs here, he also was the head of Pixar. Now, how many are familiar with Pixar? By a show of hands. Okay, so you know that you're familiar with these companies. Pixar, of course, the animation studios at Pixar, they created Toy Story and some of these great movies, eventually acquired by Disney, where Jobs became a multi billionaire as the, uh, the, the, the major shareholder at, at Disney. This is after he got chucked out of Apple, and we'll talk about that tonight. He was literally kicked out of Apple for being a bad boy. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't get to go to Buffalo State College, so he didn't know all the rules of the road and, and how to behave at meetings. And when the guys started coming in with the Harvard MBAs and he started throwing things at them, they made him leave. You know, just bad, bad discipline, bad self-discipline. Uh, but other companies, I worked with Pixar, but I also worked with eBay. I worked with Pierre Amidior and then later Meg Whitman, who ran for governor. And she was actually a marketing genius, except when she was running for governor, she spent $175 million running as a Republican gubernatorial candidate, and her popularity went down with the more she spent. So money spent on a marketing campaign, that's the first lesson of marketing, is not always good money spent. Maybe it was a bad product, I don't know. Um, Next Computer we worked with for several years. Next was a big customer of ours when I was at CKS. And again, I was at Apple for four years, and then I started this other company and became an entrepreneur, self-employed, which is the smartest thing I ever did because I got to work for myself. And we got to work with Steve Jobs and all these great guys. <clears throat> but before that, I was here. And this gentleman on the far right, that's me on the pyramid, by the way. We, I was a pyramid climber, a very adept one. One of the teachers, Joan McDonald, pointed out that I, in fact, had been pyramid climbing. I found these old slides, and I brought them into Photoshop to age them. And there's the result. I took a shot of the, I took a shot of the uh, Rockwell Hall last night, and I aged it a little bit. It looks much better. And that's Professor George Tomasevich. I had four classes with Dr. Tomasevich here. How many of you remember him? Does anybody remember him? He was the, uh, he taught paleoanthropology, culture and personality, had a great personality. He taught linguistics and just some amazing classes. And I think I had a total of four classes in graduate school with Dr. Tomasevich. Well, turns out, he wound up out in Berkeley and he became, we became good friends again actually when he moved back to California or, or to California. But anyway, this is what I actually did before heading west. <clears throat> I put this down because I like to give people an intro introduction to brands a little bit, you know, so you understand when we're talking about brands. Now, this is a gentleman, you probably recognize him, um, and this is what, how he defined his brand actually in a series of debates and throughout his campaign. He, he talked about fiscal responsibility, building a better economy, jobs and prosperity. Individual freedom, responsibility, commitment to tra traditional social values and conservative worldview, adherence to the Constitution of the United States, strong militarily, and leadership in foreign, and blah, blah, blah. You got the message, right? But this is how the competition defined him. The party of no, indifferent to the poor, proponents of the rich, anti-immigrant, war on women, racist, misogynist, homophobic. This is really bad, actually, but this is the way the guy was characterized. And the guy that characterized him that way did a much better job of presenting his brand. The party of hope and change, everybody's, you gotta love that. Champions of the middle class, commitment to social programs, progressive worldview, uh, blah, blah, blah. Progressive foreign policy relying on diplomacy and discussion, welcoming to immigrants of all backgrounds and creating opportunity for everyone. Everyone would agree this is basically the platform of the Democratic Party uh, and President Barack Obama. But the other guys defined him differently. They said European-style socialist, mounting debt social programs, excessive taxation, uber-liberal on social issues, weakening of America, responsible for anemic growth, not pro-business, and you get the great crony capitalism. You get the picture here, right? 
So people try to present their case and build their brand based on their assumptions and their positioning. And somebody asked me tonight, uh, earlier tonight, they said, well, what's the most important thing in branding and marketing? If you're an entrepreneur, what's the most important thing that you can possibly do? And I, I guess we did a lot of work at Apple on this particular thing, and we found that differentiation is the most important thing that you can do. Looking different. So I go into companies in Silicon Valley all the time, right? And the first thing they'll show me is, Look at this company here, look at their logo, look at their ad campaigns, and I want to be just like them. And that's the absolute opposite of what you need to do. You need to differentiate. We were talking about Buffalo State tonight. How could you position Buffalo State uh, in a marketplace where it's very competitive, trying to get the best students you, you, can, you can attract to the school? How do you do that? You do it by differentiation. And if you don't have a point of differentiation, you have to invent one. Okay, Apple's compelling narrative, it's a story. When you're building a business, when you're creating a product, you're also setting up a story. And it starts out with these two kids in a garage. And I, believe me, I, know, I, know, I knew both of them. Before he died, I mean, Steve Jobs was a really interesting character. But the guy that was more interesting was Steve Wozniak. Steve Wozniak, to this day, he drives around on one of those uh, Segways with a helmet. And he definitely needs a helmet, this guy. And he is probably the most eccentric, multi-billionaire, millionaire, whatever he is, I have no idea. This guy's crashed planes, he's crashed into walls. He was a celebrity on Dancing with the Stars, even though he couldn't dance. All the nerds got out there and voted for him, right? This guy's a master at branding himself as a nerd. And he's pretty good at it, and he's also pretty good at programming. So these two guys, they have this great story. They start out by making a thing called the, uh, the blue box. Do you know what the blue box is? Anybody ever hear of the blue box? You've heard, one guy, one nerd in the audience. You know what it is, right? It's basically the ability, they can mimic telephone, sounds and make calls anywhere in the world. So with the blue box, you, Wozniak used to call the Pope and ask for the Pope. Of course, it'd be hard today. There's nobody there. But <laughs> or somebody answers the phone, you may not want to talk to him. But it's that sort of situation where you could actually call anywhere in the world. And they were selling them over at Berkeley for like 25 bucks. My brother bought one. So they're a pretty good device. That was their start as businessmen. They learned, wow, if we make something people really, really want, even if it's illegal, we can make a lot of money because if we buy all the parts and it costs us 10 bucks and we sell it for 25 bucks, that's, that's a good business model. Anyway, Apple developed the idea of insanely great products that are easy to use. And this was Steve Jobs. He used to walk around and this was his mantra. Uh, how many have read Walter Isaacson's book on Apple and Steve Jobs? So quite a few, right? Okay, in that book, it's, uh, Jobs is accurately depicted, although you don't get some of the more colorful inside stories, like when he insulted advertising guys or when he insulted the creative teams and told them their, worth, their work looked like shit. He goes, this is the worst shit work I've ever seen. And he was pretty abrasive. And people used to say, what's wrong with Steve Jobs? He's abrasively honest. He had no, I mean, he had, he had no ability to, no political correctness skills. He needed to go to college. He had none of that stuff. But he was, they called it, he said, Steve Jobs abrasively honest. You don't want to deal with that. But he also had a major impact on several things. He revolutionized the computer industry in terms of user interface and design. The whole thing that we use, the mouse, or if you look at the smartphone, the way that's designed, he was a complete fanatic about user interface design. And that became the personality of the Apple products. He also brought about remarkable innovation in the cell phone industry. I have somewhere in the audience here, I, le I lent it out. I have a cell phone, a smartphone, an Apple iPhone, how many use an iPhone? Show of hands again. Okay, quite a, everybody, right? In California, it'd be 100%. Here, it's only 98. So who's buying the other crap? That's what I want to know. Anyway, so a lot of people, one guy, <laughs> he's got one. What the heck? So a lot of people have smartphones, but smartphones have gone beyond anything because, you know, if you have one of these devices, I mean, I get lost a lot, you can tell. So I have a GPS system in there. I can do all kinds of, I have a camera. Somebody's saying, oh, you got 3,000 photos on your iPhone. I go, that's just this week. I've been taking a lot of photos. I've got a lot of time on my hands. So that kind of thing. So you really begin to realize that he completely redefined what a smartphone was all about. And he made it easy, radically easy to use. It was pretty cool. Then he also transformed the music industry, not just with the iTunes store. How many, how many of you have downloaded from the iTunes store? If you're under 25, 100%, right? Gus, why not? Don't you do Irish Rovers or something you can use? You even got the old man's music. Get old man's music out. Anyway, so you have all kinds of things in that revolution. But also the iPod, an amazing innovation. 
where you see kids going around with the little white strings hanging out, you know, it's like, this is amazing stuff. He completely changed the music industry. With Pixar, when he was at Pixar, totally revolutionized um, animation to the point where Disney, I mean, Disney, they used to do millions of drawings and, I don't know, you had kind of like the use, things you used to use when you were a kid. I mean, Jobs goes in there with computer animation, it completely changed that. It completely, radically transformed through Pixar how you made movies. I even watched Toy Story. I thought it was great. Altered uh, retail in formidable ways. You have Apple stores here in Buffalo, right? I mean, in California, and I gotta show you one picture of Wozniak later on, he actually waits in line. He takes pride when a new product comes out. He waits in line in the Los Gatos store. He pulls up in his moped, takes off his helmet. He's always the first guy, he has a lawn chair, first guy in line, he's a very eccentric character. And he's out there talking to people, asking, I said, I said to him, Waz, I actually interviewed him for a publication. I said, Waz, why would you wait online? The Apple would give you 20 products free. I mean, you could get them six months ago before they launch. He goes, but it's the user experience of being out here. That's what matters to me. I can be out here with the people and really learn to appreciate what it's like to, as, you know, it's like a Christmas surprise. I don't want to open up my Christmas presents, you know, prematurely. So he's actually part of that whole culture as well. So it altered retail. Steve Jobs altered retail in formidable ways. And then he changed advertising marketing in the digital age. And we're going to talk about that tonight, primarily. He really did revolutionize marketing. You know, when we look at marketing today, that's uh, Times Square. You all recognize it. It's where it's downstate where those horrible people live that take all your tax money. And uh, <laughs> do you still complain about them? So, so, yeah, so it's Times Square. And you look at Times Square at midnight, you know, any night of the week, and it's so confusing. And this is what the average brain has to contend with. We don't even realize. We evolved from these simple primates that were like in the, and I was just actually not too long ago, I was in, uh, uh, you know, in, in the Congo and looking at, talking to the gorillas up there in the Congo region. And it's so simple, you know, certain things are so simple. And you imagine putting descendants of creatures like this, hominids, homo habilis, homo erectus, whatever, into that environment and have to deal with all this clutter all this visual garbage that's out there. And that's what you deal with every day. You're on the internet or you're watching television, but you're just absolutely inundated with all kinds of clutter. And that's why your messaging, Steve Jobs really believed, and it was a revolutionary idea, your messaging has to be simple. And he comes back, he comes back from his great walkabout, that's what the aboriginals call it, where he went to India and he hung around like with the Beatles, uh, the, you know, the Krishna kind of guys, hung around all these different guys. He's from California, it's a perfectly normal behavior. And he hangs out, does a walkabout, comes back and he says, you know, our culture is too complicated. Our products are too complicated. Our devices are way too, and our marketing communications and advertising, way too complicated. So he got, he got into this whole idea of minimalist communications. And they mentioned this a little bit in the Isaacson book. So if you look at differentiation, what could be more different? I met both, both of these gentlemen. And the guy on the right, he's a nice guy. He really is. I met him the first time on a boat in Australia. And he was surrounded by beautiful women. He goes, why are all these women interested in me? And I go, dude, dude, you're a billionaire. <laughs> so he had no clue, but he was the nicest, kind of Midwestern, but from Seattle kind of guy. He was a really sweet guy. And the guy, the guy on the left was a killer bee. I mean, that was the, uh, he was the, he was the more the predatory type. So he's very, very different guys. But the way they position their company is very, very different. You know, it's like IBM versus Apple. And John Scully, when he came on board, when he first arrived from Pepsi, he reinforced a lot of that. But differentiation was key. This is the, I, I was telling you about Wozniak. This is the other founder. And I took this picture. We're just hanging out in front of the Los Gatos store. And I said, Woz, I, I'm going to just do a little video. And I put it out on my Facebook page. And I took this picture. And that's him. He looks like a little cherub. Uh, and he rides around on a Segway. And he's one of the richest guys in California. And he used to date some, what was the woman, the comic he used to date? Kathy Griffin, that's right. He broke up with her. He said she was, she was a smart ass. Okay, uh, we're going to run this commercial, and we're going to have to figure this out here a little bit now. We're going to have to get this. 1984 was an amazing commercial. How many remember the Super Bowl in 1985? Yeah. We're going to just run it right off the computer here. Steve Jobs, the first thing he did to absolutely radically transform advertising was he, he hired Ridley Scott, to implement an idea that came up with Lee Clow, who was the art director from Chiat Day. And I was at some of these early meetings. And he said, you know what? We got to make an ass-kicking ad. 
He goes, this is Jobs, how he talked. He goes, these goddamn ads on the Super Bowl, I mean, ha most of America's watching the goddamn football. Why can't we have an ad that's really kick-ass? This is marketing. And so, so Lee Klaus said, you know, 1984, that's like Orwell's book, you know? And look at what's happening. The world's being taken over by really creepy guys from Armok, New York, in blue suits. It was like, these guys were like against Occupy Wall Street, you know? They were in favor of Occupy Wall Street. These guys were against the, the capitalist class that was destroying entrepreneurs in California. In fact, I was telling somebody today, when the press used to call me, I was the head of the Apple II group at the time, and they called me up and they said, well, what do you think about IBM uh, launching the PC Junior, which was a horrible product, thank God. It would have put us out of business if it worked. And I said, well, you know what's going on there. And they go, what do you mean? I said, well, the Russians have infiltrated IBM. The communists have taken it over. <laughs> and what's happening there, and this is the guys from the Wall Street Journal. They go, I'm talking serious to these guys. I said, yeah, those Marxist Leninist bastards, they're taking over, and they're eventually going to undermine all the entrepreneurs on the West Coast. And it's really horrible what they're doing. And these guys were cracking up. And that, but that's where, you know, that kind of commentary and that kind of stuff as part of the Apple culture was so, you know, because nobody got chastised at Apple for making a bad press release or whatever you wanted to say. It was cool. So, because there was no adult supervision. I was the oldest guy there and I was 34. <laughs> and it was like, well, the average guy was like 21, 22 years old. So there was nobody watching anybody. There was no guys walking around in suits, in other words. So this is the ad. Let me just play this ad for you because this says it all. And it's produced by Ridley Scott. How are we on sound back there? OK. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the A little bit higher sound, louder. computer will introduce Macintosh, and you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. Now, how many, have, admit it, how many have never seen that ad before? Only a few. Everybody's seen it. So this ad ran once. The production values in 1984 to build that ad, believe it or not, was, um, let's see here. I'm going to quit out of here and start again. The production, the production, the total production on that was uh, $1 million, which was an ungodly sum at the time. And um, so, so essentially, Apple, yeah, we got to move it forward now. Get past these guys. Uh, it was an amazing, it was an amazing amount of money at the time. And it only, it only appeared one time it was, you know, it's like you talk about reach and frequency. It, it basically went against every law of advertising. When I was working at Pepsi, we talked about how many GRPs you're going to nail down. It was all this MBA gobbledygook. And they'd, they'd put out really mediocre Betty Crocker type ads that you'd have to run a thousand times before any impressions were, and then people actually got something from it. Where Jobs really believed that you had to create emotion by setting up something and really hit them once and hit them really hard and that you could get your message out with one really good ad as opposed to, you know, spending a little bit of money on the creative and a lot of money on the media buy. It's a very different thing. And that's the, the lesson of, of, of Meg, uh, Meg Whitman from former, former CEO of uh, 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 eBay. No, not Yuli. She's at Yuli Packard now. But former CEO of eBay, but now she's at Yuli Packard. She spent the God, ungodly sum of like $170 million trying to get elected. Jerry Brown, who I worked on his uh, campaign uh, when he became Attorney General of California, he spent like $4 million against the $170, $180 million campaign. And he kicked her butt. And it wasn't because he was a Democrat and she was a Republican. It's because people, his message resonated and he was very simple in what he had to say. Very simple, but very, very strong, very strong message. So 
you know, that's the difference. It's not a question of how much money. And this is the lesson that we learned from Steve Jobs, not so much how much money, but how good is, how good is the message. And this happened in 1984, 80, 80, 85 actually, January 85, the Super Bowl. And this was the beginning of the change in marketing. So there was this time, and I won't get into the details, where, where Steve left the company. And it was for like many, many years. We had Apple reunions, and we'd call him up. And I was the head of the Apple reunion committee. Uh, and, and I'd say, uh, you, can you make it? And he goes, you know, it's like a girlfriend. He always talked metaphors. He started talking in metaphors and started acting crazy. He said, well, it's like a girlfriend. You break up with her, and you don't really want to see her again. He goes, I was really in love with Apple, but now I've got Next, and I, I don't love Apple as much because I'm in love with Next, and I got Pixar. I go, Steve, this is way too complicated, dude. Just come. You know, we'd like to see you there, and everybody wants to see you. It's a reunion. It's people. It's, it has nothing to do with Apple. He goes, no, I can't make it. And he was like that. So he was gone for a while. He comes back. John Scully leaves because there's a major failure called the Newton. We did all the marketing for the Newton. We spent, they spent $40 million with us. And one of the things I do when I do my Santa, Santa Clara University case studies on marketing, I always say, the Newton is an amazing case study because the great marketing, we killed that product in 30 days because we got people in the stores and they tried it. And they said, this thing really doesn't work. It was for handwriting recognition. So you wrote it in Sid and it thought you were Cynthia. It didn't work. It was one of the most failed products that Apple ever launched. Well, John Scully got blamed. He got thrown out. Another guy comes in, and next thing you know, a whole bunch of guys come in and out. It's like a revolving door. So Steve winds up. He shows up at Apple. He comes back, and he works his way back in. He takes a dollar a year salary, and the first thing he does, they say, Steve, we don't have any products. We're going out of business. We're in deep, deep doo-doo. And he says, you know, if we just change, we, we really have these, these Macs that look pretty cool, but if we just made them like, more like candy and we change colors a little bit, maybe people will buy them. And he came out with these. You remember these products? When, in the, so he launched a bunch of them. And all of a sudden, Apple started getting a little bit of life. You know, the people were writing them off. They thought it was dead. Speaking of dead, Steve comes up with this campaign in the 90s. This is about the time we pick him up again as a client, a major client. We actually had him from, from when I started a company in 87 right through to 2000. We kept Apple as a client. And this campaign, well, they, we kept Apple beyond that. I left the company. This campaign, Jobs figured a way without any money how to get dead people to endorse his product. He said, you know what? We won't have to pay Einstein. He's dead. But Einstein, everybody can, you know, everybody recognizes that Einstein's so brilliant. You know, if he would use a Mac, everybody should use Macs, right? Because he's so cool. John Lennon, he's dead. We'll get him. So they start doing all these black, black and white ad campaigns called Think Different, right? So, you know, if you want to be like everybody else, you know, not so cool, then you do what you're going to do. But if you want to be part of this whole Apple thing, you want to think different, and you want to be like Einstein, come and buy a Macintosh. This really resonated, because still, Apple still didn't have many great products. They were beginning to turn things around. And this campaign went everywhere. It was, on, it was in print, it was in TV, it was in outdoor, it was on bus backs, it was on the sides of buses. I mean, the marketing was absolutely incredible. Some of the best marketing. The other thing he did is he fired the big New York ad agency, BBDO, and he hired Chaya Day again, Lee Cloud. He brought all his buddies back in. My former business partner, Tom Suter, head of creative services when Steve was at Apple, he brought him back in. So CKS got a big piece of the action. He brought his old creative folks back into Apple. And even the Dalai Lama, who was still alive, said, hey, I don't use this stuff, but if I did, I'd use a Mac. And uh, <laughs> St Steve's Buddhist roots. And of course, he loved the Beatles. When I was at Apple in 85, Wozniak had a thing called the Us Festival. We used to give computers to every musician that asked free, as many as they wanted. Herbie Hancock used to get, Herbie Hancock was a jazz musician, he had two or three computers here. Um, anybody that wanted them that was in the music business, because we always really pushed uh, musicians to use Apple computers, whether, whether it be an Apple II in the early days with Herbie Hancock, or later on with Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson was an absolute junkie for Macs. All the people in Hollywood wanted to have a Mac. And we provided those things free. Because we felt as though if we could get Hollywood to use our computers. If you remember the early Star Trek movies, when they brought back the Star Trek movies, always Macintoshes on the Starship Enterprise. Steve said, if people see us on the Starship Enterprise, and they know Einstein's using our computer, Right? So uh, <laughs> Jim Henson had already died, the, founder, the guy that started the Muppets. 
he would have used a Mac, and he, there was actually a whole campaign, and actually St Steve almost wrote the copy here, because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. These, this is a message from an entrepreneur. Because entrepreneurs, one of the things I say about entrepreneurs, I've met so many entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. People say, well, are, are entrepreneurs born that way? You know, they, they get up in the morning and they say, what's an entrepreneur? And I said, an entrepreneur could never work for the federal government. They couldn't. They wouldn't know what to do. They would be bored. They have to do stuff. They have to translate uh, their ideas into reality. I don't care if it's a small idea or starting a new type of pizzeria or a big idea like starting a major computing, uh, computer company. They have to do what they say they're going to do. That's just their nature. And they'll go through walls. They'll do whatever it takes to get the job done. That's what entrepreneurs are all about. I think, uh, well, how does it apply to college educations today? I think we should reintroduce guys like Emerson and Thoreau and people who support ideas like self-reliance. Not Ayn Rand, I'm not going to go that far, right? But I'm saying people that support self-reliance and self-reliant people, uh, who, guys that really want to create a business and make something happen. You guys, you wouldn't be involved in entrepreneurship if you weren't seriously thinking about that. And people say, okay, yeah, I live in Buffalo, what am I going to do here? You know, the, the economy, this place is, we talk about a recession, you know, Buffalo was in a recession when I left and I came back. It's, you know, still in a recession. I mean, the, the bills are still here, and you still have the sabers, and it's a beautiful place. The architecture's amazing. The people are the nicest people on the planet, but how do you get the economy started here? I, I have some ideas, and if you want to talk to me later about it, I'll tell you. Because th this place has tremendous potential. You know, you have fresh water. That's a big deal, because in California, we're losing ours. It's being stolen by Canadians. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, so think different. You know, one of the things you, about Apple advertising, when you look at an Apple ad, you always can tell the marketing. It's just so self-evident. It's so apparent. So here's where I got involved in this stuff. You know, we did a study in 85. And I, was, and I took a, a course here at Buffalo State called Culture and Personality. And I love that class because you used to not just study the culture, but the modal personality. We used to study some cultures and we'd look at them objectively and say, hey, everybody in this culture is like crazy. This is amazing. Or everybody in this culture, they work really hard. Or people in the Amish country, man, they, these people eat too many noodles. You know, we just make certain assumptions. We studied these different cultures, tried to develop a sort of model for what is the modal personality of this group of people. And there's a lot of generalizations based on it. At Apple, we did this study and we said, okay, if we could anthropomorphize and we could um, look at Apple, what would Apple be in 1985? And people would say things like, oh yeah, it's a, it's a dude living on the west coast, he drives a foreign car, probably a Porsche 911, and he's real friendly and affable and likable, and he's the kind of guy that if he sees a little old lady with a flat tire, he'll pull over and change the tire. He's a real helpful guy. Well, what is the guy, what is IBM? They say, oh, that's a dude living on the east coast in a blue suit, he's really boring, he's Protestant, he drives an American car, a new one, unlike the guy Radio Shack in Texas drives an old one. And uh, he's really boring, but he's reliable, and you probably won't get fired for buying some of his stupid products. And then you get to Radio Shack, and it's like, oh, this is a guy who never wears natural fabrics. He lives in Texas. He's about 50-something. He has a little distended belly, and his tie only comes down halfway. And he's got one of every known tool on the planet in his garage. So we begin to make, oh, wow, this stuff with marketing is really about creating a personality, isn't it, for a company? and really building your brand around a certain persona. And that, this is really true. You look at this guy on the right, you know, that's the Apple guy. And that's the guy who we model our company after. He's, he's kind of a good guy, you know, he's real helpful. He, and the guy, the guy on the left is the guy we made fun of. He was the, guy, he was the communist. He was, the guy was like the Red Baron. He was like giving money to the Russians to overthrow our government. And we, you know, it was our job to tell the people at the Wall Street Journal. So that's the difference. But if you look at this, and I have a campaign I'm going to show you real quick that's kind of cute. If you look at this difference here between jobs, and that's after he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer on the left, he's still, you know, very different than the guy on the right. How many have seen the commercials, I'm an Apple, or I'm a Mac, I'm a PC? Do you want me to run a couple, or do you want me to keep moving here? Because I've got a lot more to cover. You just want me to run a couple? Okay, I'll do that for you guys. I think you're good guys, and I'll do it. Okay. If I can find it, here it is.
And this really plays to the... Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. What are you reading? Just the Wall Street Journal. It's not... Oh, no, no, no. no PC. You know what? Oh, it's a review of you. D -d Don't read it. Oh, it's, it's from a... Walt Mossberg, one of the most respected technology experts on the planet. Apparently, you're the finest desktop PC on the market at any price. Very nice. It's just one man's opinion. I actually got a great review this morning, too. Oh, And they said I was awesome. Good for you. And so we're the same. Yeah, what, same. what was that in? The um, awesome, awesome computer review weekly journal. Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. We've got a little network going here, and uh, it was very easy to set up. We speak each other's language. We share our internet connection, and all sorts of things we do together. Who now, who's this now? What's... Oh, this is that new digital camera from Japan. Just came out. Hajimemashite. Uh, Hajimemashite. Yoroshiku onegashimasu. Wait, 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 wait. You speak her language? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Everything just kind of works with a Mac. Ah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh. <laughs> hello. Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. Oh, hey, iPod, nice. Yeah, it's just a little something to hold my slow jams. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah, and it works so seamlessly with iTunes. You should check out iMovie, iPhoto, iWeb, because they all work like iTunes. You know, oh. iLife comes on every Mac. iLife. Well, I, I have some very cool apps that are bundled with, with me. Well, like, what do, you, what do you got? Calculator. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Anything else? A clock. A cl clock. Sounds like, sounds yeah. like hours of fun. Yeah. Or at least you got to see these together, a couple of them. Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. You know, we use a lot of the same kinds of programs. Yeah, like Microsoft Office. But uh, we retain a lot of what makes us us. But you should see what this guy can do with a spreadsheet. It's insane. <laughs> oh, shucks. Yeah, and he knows that I'm better at life stuff, like music, pictures, movies, stuff like that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What, what exactly do you mean by better? By better, I mean making a website or photo book is easy for me, and for you, it's not. Oh, oh that kind of better. Yeah. I, I was thinking of the other kind. What other kind? Hello, I'm a Mac. Hello, I'm a PC. We have a lot in common these days. Uh, we, we both, both run a Microsoft, Microsoft office. office. We share files. It's great. We just get along. PC. Yep. OK. Hi, I'm a PC. OK, we're past that. We moved beyond that. Yeah, I had to restart there. You, you know how it is. No, actually, I don't. Oh, what? Macs don't have to. You get it. Adam, <laughs> and we lost it. I'm going to go get IT. Keep an eye on it. So, yeah, so you can see, I mean, on that personality campaign, so this, we might say, to the anthropology department at, at Buff State is um, an example of how anthropology, I don't know if it's a good example, can benefit a marketing campaign. Because what we do is we start out and we basically build, uh, you know, we build, our, we build our campaign based around this sort of anthropomorphizing and this personality. And this campaign had great wheels and it lasted for several years, and it did a lot of damage to the PC platform. Absolute, actually, Macintosh, which had a minuscule uh, market share, began to really capture some of that market share, certainly back in education. I don't know what the situation is here, but my neighbor, the guy who lives literally down the street, and I steal all the grapes from his vine, um, he has, he's the head of Apple Education K through University, and he's telling me that it's insane. I mean, the business for, for selling Macintoshes especially, and not just Macintoshes, but iPads to universities, has gone through the roof. And a lot of it has to do, I think, with their repositioning of the brand, and also enhancing the product. They, when, when, they, when Apple bought Next from Steve Jobs, one of the things he did when he came back, he sold Next to his old company. Well, they got the best operating system in the world. How many are familiar with the thing called Next Step? Next Step is awesome. I mean, it's a Unix-based system. Well, that's, a Mac is based on this incredible technology, so all of a sudden, Next becomes a skunk works for Apple, and they picked up the whole company, and people thought it was outrageous. Why are you buying Next for 200 or $300 million at the time? It was a steal, because it completely revolutionized the way the Mac is. Again, music was a big deal, still is a big deal, helped reposition the company, gave it the coolness factor. And you can see when they bring out guys like Bono, and this is Steve Jobs launching the iPod, he said, wow, if we can just get these little things, these little devices in the hands of kids, uh, they're going to be predisposed to wanting to buy our other products as well. And he was absolutely right. He said, look, the whole world's going digital. This guy thought like Marshall McLuhan in a lot of ways. You know, he's, he'd see the world, you know, even Mark McLuhan talks about the medium being the message, whatnot. I mean, Jobs saw digital convergence coming together. So all your devices, your TV, your telephone, everything you own 
is going to be digitally based. It's all down to ones and zeros. You know, you're not going to have any analog things anymore. And this is a big shift. So making music everywhere. So one of the cool things about that campaign, that, iP that iPod campaign, it was so simple. Think about it. It translates into Japanese, no problem, because it's all visual. And everybody knows who Bono is, right? YouTube. Uh, it's, and you had the special Bono edition of the iPod. That's like a Michael Jordan sneaker from Nike. That's pretty cool marketing. But he has all these things that he's doing in technology marketing that have never been attempted before. And the fact is that on the sides of barns, you can put the same graphics that you put on a billboard, and people love it, and, and, and it makes them feel good. Steve announces the iPhone. I remember when I was there for this. This is actually up in Moscone, and, which is in San Francisco, where they, they launched most of the Apple products historically, and they used to have the, the, the Apple festivals up there. So they launch this product, and people, he actually walks through the whole thing, and he starts taking telephone calls from his friends, and he's putting them on hold. How many have seen this? The most amazing, what do you think the most amazing thing that he did as, as, as a businessman, as an entrepreneur, he said, I'm going to take this stuff and I'm going to put it on the inter internet so everybody can see me introducing it, number one. But number two, I'll walk you through a demo so you get conceptual trial. In other words, you don't even have to go to a computer store to see if you like it. The pent-up demand was enormous for the iPhone. They looked at the numbers and it's like, in the Bay Area, 90% of the people, 18 to 35, your demographic, they wanted one. As soon as they saw it, they went to the, the internet, they went to the Apple site, and they, they went through the whole trial thing. You can actually run through it as a, a part of a trial device on the internet. And they heard Steve giving a speech. And this guy is pretty charismatic, right? And they wind up, and they all wind up buying, you know, high percentage, get, get, get into it, and they, they wind up buying it. So that's the ac actual tour. You could actually take a tour so you could see, oh, wow, it's got GPS. I can drive. I don't need a GPS system anymore. Oh, look at this camera. It really works. You know, the other aspects of it. So if you have an iPhone, you know all the things. I have really weird applications on it. Like, I'm a Civil War buff, so I go to Gettysburg where my son goes to college. I've got an application where I can walk up a little round top. I'm standing in one place, and I'll say, what happened here? And I'll say, about three feet from where you're standing, you'll get all this data. Um, you know, Colonel so-and-so got shot in the knee. You know, it's like, wow, I didn't know that. I'm right where he got shot, you know? So it's that kind of thing. But it's a weird application. You've got to be weird to enjoy it. So, <laughs> you know, Baldwin's a funny guy, but that's true. Uh, yeah, Alec Baldwin. So Apple was always, I, I told you, they were like really big on Star Trek. A lot of the Apple guys were Trekkies and whatnot. They were really big on pushing this message and getting people really interested and motivated. And the way to do that, would, that what better way than a guy like Jerry Seinfeld? I mean, have him go out there and pitch your product. Uh, you know, so these are just a few of the people I love Alec Baldwin, but I mean, even the Starship Enterprise, knowing that, uh, I remember the one movie that came out and they, they had a Macintosh there and, and Spock picks up the mouse and he thinks it's a microphone. Do you remember that? I don't, that was a while ago. So anything, any time to get in a movie or to have a celebrity help you market your product because it gives instant brand cred, street cred to the product. And I think Obama does this better than any president. You know, having Mrs. Obama at the Academy Awards is brilliant. You know, you may not like it if you're a Republican. You may say, well, that's really tacky, and they go on. I didn't like the way she was dressed, but it's all irrelevant. The fact is that, that the Academy Awards, that's a big deal, and to have a person in politics there giving the award, best picture, whatever, is a big, a major achievement. It's a major marketing coup. Okay, one of the things that blew me away is when they launched the retail store. This is the one in New York. And I was doing a speech in Manhattan, and I, was, I, was, uh, I went into that store and I talked to the manager. And I said, this is, again, when I was at uh, CKS, uh, Cleary, called me and Souter. And I said, you know, actually, this is after that fact. I asked him, how many iPhones are you guys selling? He said, I can't tell you how many iPhones we're selling in this store, but we're doing a million dollars a day in iPhone business. I said, a million dollars for one store? I go, that's crazy. He said, yeah, that's why we're going to build one that's bigger than two Macy's. We're going to have the, and they're building this massive store in Manhattan. So these stores were just incredible. To think that you could sell a million dollars worth of iPhones in one store uh, is beyond, beyond belief. And of course, the graphics on the outside of the building is always part of Steve's vision that, you know, you turn the building into an ad. You make your store like a giant ad. It's cool. 
And this is so cool. Apple is so cool that in China today, this shot was taken in Beijing. Beijing, they have a clone store. And it's so cool. They got a, uh, you go in that store and they have a, a genius bar. Uh, they have all the things. They wear the t-shirts. You can't tell it's not an Apple store. The only way you can tell is on an Apple store on the outside, they just have the Apple logo. In Beijing, they got Apple store written in English. That's the only way you can tell because they're, they're stealing all the component parts from the factories where they assemble. So they're making real Mac products, real iPhones, real I, iPads and iPods. And plus, they're basically copying everything, even the graphics on the inside of the store, everything. So they're having a hard job shutting it down, but that's, that's an incredible compliment to think that your competition is, is ripping you off that way. So the other thing with keeping it simple is it has to port internationally. If you're an international brand and you have something you want to sell internationally, the keep it simple messaging works really well. So here we are in England. So if you're doing an Apple you know, iPhone demo and you're trying to walk somebody through it, keep it very visual and keep it real simple, the messaging. And the positioning has to be real clear. It's about access and ease of use, if that's the message. Make sure uh, that you're able to port that to other countries, other languages, wh whatever. Um, people say, OK, what's going to happen now that everybody, if you have my phone, I gave my phone, I lent it out. Can I borrow it back one second? People are saying stuff like, what's going to, thank you so much. What's going to happen, we didn't want to be interrupted, when, when the iPhone is replicated by Samsung, whatever. And my attitude is, Siri, what's going to happen when the iPhone looks just like the Samsung phone? What are you guys going to do? Checking my sources. OK. She's, she doesn't have the information right now, but I can tell you this. What Apple's working on is with, with Siri is artificial intelligence. Because we, we did a video from that. People say, you know, well, how is Apple going to keep innovation going with Steve Jobs is gone now? They've got stuff in the pipeline for 20, 30 years. And one of the things we looked at 20 years ago, we made this video, and actually the creative guys invented the iPad. Because he said, this is what we'd really like, except it's got a little person in it that talks to you. It's like he comes up and he goes, can I help you? He's a guy. And he's a little anthropomorphized entity, and you interact with him. And it's actually a Berkeley professor talking to this guy and just pulling down data from every place on the planet looking at deforestation with his colleagues in England. And the guy's collecting all the data and doing all the work. And it's brilliant because you could say to your little anthropomorphized entity, your little Sari character in there, you could say, hey, go make me two reservations. I want to go here and here for dinner tonight. I want to catch a plane on Monday. And by the way, call my wife and tell her I'm going to be late for dinner. And it will all be handled because it's artificial intelligence. They're working on this right now. And there's a guy by the name of Marvin Minsky at MIT who pioneered this. And Apple's really big on taking the iPhone and differentiating their brand of smartphone and making it super smart with, through this technology. And I think uh, Siri is the beginning of that. So it's really differentiate all over again. When, when the competition starts making it look like a parity situation and they beat you on price and you can't beat them on the brand argument and they're 20% cheaper and they come from Korea and they can actually out manufacture you, you've got to reinvent yourself to stay ahead of the curve. And that's, that's a big part of what Apple does in the marketing front. So, iPhone. OK, so success with the iPhone. The most, probably the most successful launch of, in the history of Apple, the iPhone. Incredible brand preference, which is this predisposition to want to buy a specific product. It's called brand preference. And Apple is off the meter on that when it came to the iPhones. And it came to subsequent revs of the iPhone. Amazing. And that has to do with that conceptual trial. When you go to Apple's website, and you're going through it, and absolutely you're experiencing the product. You're getting conceptual trial before you even have to go to a store. You know what to do. We invented a thing. Um, we were doing web, big websites for General Motors, Disney, all the Fortune 500 companies. Because we'd go into those Fortune 500 companies when I started Clary, Kwame, and Souter, and we'd say to the CEOs, if you don't hire us to do a website, you're going to lose your job. Everybody has a website. It's like 100 years ago, if you weren't a mason, you wouldn't be able to get a job. You need a website. We'd, we'd make jokes with them and everything. I said, you're right. I would get fired. I better get a website going. So guys like the head of Disney and General Motors and this Ford Motor Company. In General Motors, we innovated on this idea of conceptual trial. We created that whole thing. You see it now with BMW. Everything. Everybody has it where you can change the color on the cars. You can change the interiors. 
We had it where you could turn on the radio and stuff, but the, the web didn't have the bandwidth to handle it. We had some incredible stuff. We developed our own software, creative software, for use on the internet. And that was a big deal. This stuff here, though, is probably, the iPhone's probably the most significant launch in the history of product launches anywhere. Great word of mouth. People loved it, highly differentiated. We go back to that word differentiation. Well-aligned marketing program, including the advertising, the merchandising, online activities in-store. Number one smartphone in the world. And again, Apple New York City, a million dollars a day in smartphones. And when people say, when I tell people about differentiation, I go, that's the key to brands. If you differentiate, if you differentiate in the way you advertise and market, if you differentiate in the products themselves and the way you interact with the products, if you differentiate on all fronts, you're going to win the war. You have to because people, the average person, you know, some of the marketing folks today were talking to me about Buffalo State. What do we need to do here to attract students? And I said, you have to differentiate. You have to be different. You don't want to look like every other SUNY school or you'll lose the battle. I don't care if it's, oh, we're, we have access to Elmwood Avenue. It's really hip and it's cool. And you come out here and you'll meet a lot of people. Whatever it is, whatever differentiation that's attractive. And in the 18 to 34 demographic, or the 18, in your case, the 18-year-old demographic, if you want to attract people, you've got to do it now with the internet, and you've got to be innovative as all get and go. I mean, you really have to be out in front of it. So anyway, these guys were real successful in the launch of that product, unlike the Newton. Okay, if you look at premium brands, this is Apple's share. Now, they don't have the dominant share of the market, but look at their share. This is about eight months old, this chart. Look at their share of profitability. That's where it comes down to. Of all the phones, profit share, of all the phones, Samsung out, probably outselling them on units, but they're not making enough money because they're trying to buy market share by lowering their prices, which is a typical Japanese strategy. Years ago, they'd lower the price of a Lexus way below Mercedes. Once they have the market share, they raise the prices. So they lose money for a bunch of years. Well, that's what's happening here. Look at Apple. But again, Apple, to stay ahead, has to continually reinvent itself. What the greatest thing, what they do better than anything, is the reinventing of Apple, where you get these devices here, like the, uh, you know, the actual iPads. I got one, my first one when it first came out a couple of years ago. And I have to tell you, I hardly use my computer, because I use this thing for accessing the internet. I use it for just about everything that I used to use a computer. The only thing, if I'm doing a presentation, or if I want to edit video, and I'm out there, I need a full, big screen Macintosh. But everything else, I mean, you can do Unless you need word processing, you don't want to go to, you know, a really, they got a really rudimentary word processor on the iPad, but you can, you know, you can't get into Word or any of that stuff, at least not now anyway. So this is the thing. But again, look at the simplicity of these ads and the way they present the product. It's all about the product. It's the sleekness of design. It's the simplicity of the presentation. It's just where, where it really comes from is the fact that Jobs and Wozniak are product geeks at heart. These guys love this stuff. It's like my youngest son, Tomas. I call him Tomasito. He's a great lacrosse player, but at the end of the day, the guy's a gadget freak. And he comes up and he goes, Dad, look at this. I just did this on my iPhone. He edits videos. He's 13 years old. He makes these videos. And he puts them on YouTube. And I go, son, you're going to get in a lot of trouble if you keep putting videos out there like that. And he goes, aren't you? They're funny. But I said, they're not, they're not appropriate for your age group. <laughs> I said, I don't know who the hell's been influencing you, but that's a bad man. <laughs> He's a very cool kid, but he's going to get me in trouble. I'm going to have to really go in the witness protection program. So, and then it gets to the outdoor thing. Again, Apple is the first company to use because we, we have a lot of freeway time. If you've been to the San Francisco Bay Area going up on 101 or 280, going up heading toward the city, we're a fairly big metro area, you spend a lot of time on a freeway. And this is a great opportunity to communicate to your constituency, your target constituency, in the most cost-effective way. This is what I love. When all these guys are up on Wall Street complaining about the capitalists, which they should complain about. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I hate those guys that sell make-believe products, you know, hedge fund guys. And I don't like them, you know, because that stuff's all make-believe. It's all air. It's not a real product. I, I, I hope no, nobody's going into that line of work. When I was doing this presentation at Harvard with the MBA program, they got really upset with me. And I said, you know, Harvard, you guys should ought to have an Occupy movement at Harvard. You guys have created more billionaires than any other school in America. You've got 46 billionaires out there, including one dropout, this guy, the little kid that started Facebook. I said, this is bad. You're producing a lot of mega capitalists out here. 
But these guys were amazing, because here they are sitting, occupying Wall Street, and they got all their devices. They're all wires. Like, this thing is really creating a revolution out there. You know, it's really changing the world. You got these guys, not just the Occupy Wall Street movement, which was harmless, but think about the Arab Spring. I spent a lot of time in Egypt, Gus knows this, in Cairo. I know Tahir Square. And there was nothing going on there when I was there. And now you create revolutions, you change governments. I mean, it's pretty amazing. So, the message of jobs for you would-be entrepreneurs and marketers is keep it simple. By the way, that on the lower right is the new Apple store, the model. And it's really simple communications, but it's very powerful. And it's sure to elicit emotion. You have to create emotion, you have to create you know, a powerful message to get through to people because there's so much garbage out there. And everybody's saying the same thing. I talk a lot about brand loyalty with my groups that come in from Santa Clara University. We have a whole little seminar we do on brand loyalty. And I have to tell you, that's in front of the Apple store in my hometown near Los Gatos, California. And I have to tell you, I've never seen a guy, I mean, if the president died, you'd expect people to put up these instant shrines or if, you know, if you get killed along the road in a Mexican neighborhood in California, they put this, and they got the Blessed Mother there, they got major shrines go up. But I've never seen it for a businessman where they actually, across America, they, every Apple store had these little shrines and people are putting their notes and it's kind of like, whoa, this, the impact of Steve Jobs goes well beyond marketing. This is amazing stuff. Here's a guy, and, and, and people, in App, people at Apple and people that live in Silicon Valley today complain about Jobs. They said, the guy was an idiot. Why didn't he just go and have, and have the surgery that he was supposed to have? Why did he start eating more vegetables and rice and brown rice? Because that's the way Jobs was. He said, oh, I have pancreatic cancer and it's the kind you can cure, I'll just eat some vegetables and brown rice, it'll go away in a year. And that's how he died, he didn't take care of it right away. He didn't, he, he didn't, because it was a curable type of rare, curable type of pancreatic cancer. How many saw the Stanford presentation he did, the graduation? If you haven't seen it, go and look on YouTube, Steve Jobs telling you his life story and it's just really simple, it's real humble. This guy didn't complete a semester at college. He went to a little school called Reed and his parents were really poor. There's a house actually, uh, he, he came from, not too far from Cupertino where Apple's headquarters are. And he went to this little tiny college called Reed College, real exceptional guy. He was adopted, his real parents, his father was Syrian, and his mom was American. They were both PhD candidates at Berkeley. They had to give him up for adoption. And he was raised by a real simple, you know, blue collar family outside of Cupertino, California, in La, probably, near Los Altos. He went to a real simple high school with uh, Wozniak. And amazingly enough, this guy, you know, just the genius just came out. You could, it was, he was irrepressible. I mean, he just, he just rose to the occasion. And whatever innate capabilities he had, uh, and you think about the war now, I was just on the border in Turkey, the war in Syria, all these innocent people being killed. How many Steve Jobs are getting killed there? You know, it's just amazing because this guy was one of the most brilliant people you ever want to meet. Okay, so how did Apple build the greatest brand? Just to Recap, great focused leadership, insanely great products, clear differentiation, brilliant creative folks, thank you. Creative that elicits emotion and makes people think, feel, and react. Consistency through the years. Bias for action. I wish some of our politicians had that. A bias against those who are risk adverse. We used to get really upset at Apple meetings. If somebody was risk adverse, well, this could happen, this could happen. I said, we used to call the legal department in Apple when they go in there to approve our ads. We used to call them the sales prevention group. <laughs> so you go in there and we had one old Jewish guy who's a lawyer and he's a great guy. He said, Bill, you're gonna get us sued, we can't do this. And there was a young guy who's also a Jewish guy, he was his son, I think. And he'd say, ah, don't worry about him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Nobody's gonna sue us. They'll just send us a cease and desist and then we'll yank the ad. You know, he's more pragmatic. But we'd say things that, we wouldn't lie, we'd just say things that were funny and outrageous, not you know, make up stories about the products. We'd just, have a good time and have some fun with it. Uh, so yeah, basically that's a summary of, of that. And these are some of the ideas I've been submitting to Apple. This is my little Mercedes bug. And this is my perfect car. Look at the devices in there. I've been working and I, I'm still working with Apple. This is my idea. I know it's gonna go through because it's the, it's the ultimate a Apple product that every consumer must have. There's a funny story about Steve Jobs. When he launched the Macintosh, uh, they said, hey, you know, the laser printer is going to cost 10 grand. And they looked at Steve, and the marketing people were expecting him to go nuts. And he said, oh, that's really reasonable. 
They go, Steve, you're worth $400 million. The average person can't afford a 10 grand printer for their home. So, I mean, that's, that's how out of touch at that point he was. <laughs> you wouldn't want to put him in charge of pricing. <laughs> and this is my, this is my, my product. I, you know, it's a, I'm flushing out this concept, but I, I think every hotel needs a, a, you know, this thing. But where it's happening today, we have a whole new digital world, a whole new president. And I've seen some glimpses of Apple TV, and the whole world is going digital. And wouldn't it be great to have one device in your living room, not 20 things, and not 20 different controllers, but one device that can, you digitally download your movies, you download your music, everything's downloaded to one device. And I think that's where they're taking, in the long run, Apple TV, and I think it's going to be an amazing, that's going to be the next thing. I mean, they're making some other cool products, like a watch that just is killer. It's a computer watch, but you know, I'm not so excited about that as this, this idea, this concept. One of the things we talk about, we talk about this week, and I put this slide up last night, is when you think about the technology or the technological changes that we've experienced in the last 20 years, they far exceed all the changes combined that we experienced in the previous 200. I mean, it's pretty amazing. That when I look at my little 13-year-old running around with the gear he has, Christ, he could have run a bank 10 years ago. And he's running, it's just doing homework and stuff, you know, just little school. So it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. And I, I always think, I'm always, I always think back from my historical roots or, or studying history to the Gutenberg printing press. Because if you think, and I actually wrote an article in this, you think of the, the Gutenberg printing press, for the first time with movable type, we could print a book other than the Bible. You know, not that the Bible's a bad book, but it's not the only book. I mean, there's other stuff. So printing the Bible wasn't necessary, necessarily a big motivational force when it comes to literacy, right? You wanted a couple dirty books. I mean, what drove the internet? I gotta tell you, we actually knew a lot about this stuff. I can tell you what drove the internet. And it wasn't the Bible, it was a lot of other stuff. So the key thing is what's gonna happen now that you have all this cumulative technology, what's the cumulative impact of all this technology? I'm not so sure if the internet existed at the time of Shakespeare if he would have written another sonnet. I'm not so sure if Mark Twain would have come up with another joke. By the way, he used to live on Delaware Avenue, you know, I understand, from the guys in the mansion where I'm staying. But I'm not so sure of any of that. But I do know that there's a cause and effect. And when you have this much technology and this compressed a period of time being dumped on so few people, you have something transformational about to begin. In the case of the Gutenberg printing press, we had the ecclesiastical class being totally usurped. The guys who were sitting around, the scribes copying my ancient Irish ancestors that were probably monks and having lots of kids, they were copying the Bible. It was all calligraphy, right? Those guys were being replaced by a printing press where you could replicate things and produce things very quickly and disseminate things very quickly. And what do you get? You get the Renaissance, the Age of Enlightenment, our own Declaration of Independence. Guys like Thomas Jefferson, I believe he's here tonight, uh, <laughs> and a few other people. Is he here? There's Jefferson. How you doing, Tom? He's got your, head, got your ponytail cut off there, buddy. So all of these things combined have, have, have absolutely contributed in so many ways to the change in our culture. Um, I was invited. I have a, a, a friend that's in there. You find it's hard to believe. He's a, he made, he's a rapper, and uh, he, he's down in Los Angeles, and he invited me to a conference down there called On Hollywood. Uh, his name is Quincy Jones III. His mother was a Swedish model, and his father was a famous Quincy Jones. I went down there, I met all these rapper guys and stuff, and the, the things they're doing with this technology is mind-boggling. These are kids that never, they didn't grow up around computers, but they, they can weasel their way here, and they're really dexterous. And so this stuff is really exploding, what they're doing with their music, what they're doing with their sounds. I wanted to show you one uh, thing that my son did. I asked him to define, and if we have time, how much time do we have before Q&A? You guys don't mind if we go over a few minutes, do you? Okay. I don't want to screw up your night. I know it's Buffalo and there's a lot of stuff. Okay, so anthropology. Somebody said to me, how did you get from anthropology to marketing? Well, <laughs> you look at the guy in the middle. That was my idea, the, the Geico guy. I put a lot of Neanderthals to work. But, and the guy on the far right, I think he did something at some point in time. Uh, and <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, when asked if you study lots of anthropology, uh, is it applicable to your job in marketing? I'd say the answer is absolutely yes. You're studying human nature. I mean, it's terrible. It's like you're training a fox to guard the hen house. So from an anthropo if a professional anthropologist, God bless you all. I mean, you basically, when I went to school here, guys like George Tomasevich turned me into a predator. No, I'm just kidding. 
turned me into a marketing guy, uh, training me in things like culture and personality, things like language and culture, but understanding human nature, getting a good foundation in critical thinking. That's why I'm a real proponent of liberal arts colleges. I don't think we should have specialty colleges. I think everybody should go and study, I don't care what it is, biology, uh, history, economics, theater, but study something and focus on that one thing and then apply it to a bunch of other things. Somebody likes me here. The teachers from Lakeshore love me. Right? Dudes, thanks for driving all this way. We're going to have to get some beers. We'll get some Genesee after this. But they wouldn't let me drink before this, by the way. So anyway, so that's what we have there. And I, want, I do want to get to the one thing. Yeah, I want to dedicate this presentation tonight to uh, the gentleman on the right. That's Richard Leakey. And this is a funny story. When, when George Tomasevich from Buffalo State, who was the smartest guy I ever met, uh, moved to Berkeley, I used to go and see him. He was in his 80s. But he was still brilliant. He was still crazy and eccentric. And he was a great guy. And he was a true scholar. And he had all the same paintings. When I used to drive him home here at Buffalo State, I'd take him to his house. And Mama would come out and she'd cook me this great Serbian food. And I'd gain about 30 pounds. And I'd have to go running. It was terrible, but it was fun. But anyway, this guy was a brilliant guy. One day I showed up at his house. I used to bring business friends over there, guys from Apple. I showed up with Richard Leakey. I'm good friends with Richard because I work in Africa on things like Wildlife Direct, and I've done some work for Richard. Obviously, Richard doesn't pay me. I do it as a volunteer. So I show up, and, and he was blown away. He goes, how do you as a businessman know Richard Leakey? And I said, well, before I was a businessman, I studied anthropology. And I met Richard through my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law is Kenyan. I said, he's a good friend of mine. So he was blown away, and it was really a nice thing. But this is the kind of dedicated teachers that I think changed my life. People say, well, how'd you get into business, how'd you get into marketing? Guys like that gave me a lot of self-confidence to do almost anything, to go through walls if I had to. Okay, so it's time for Q&A, which is good, but before I do that, I want to play one more thing. I asked my son, who's again a sophomore at Gettysburg College, to come up with his perception of the Apple brand. Because, you know, this is it. And by the way, if there's anybody that's prone to being offended, please don't be offended. Because uh, he, he's 19, 20 years old. He's 19 when he made it. He's really immature, and I don't know where he gets that from. I think it's from his mother. But I don't know where it <laughs> This is it, yeah. So th I said to him, I said, son, turn the sound up for this, because it's uh, a little bit louder. Uh. Yep. Girls back east, just I message me on the iPhone. Don't feel like typing you Siri to get the right tone. I like Verizon, but those apps hit hard like Mike Tyson. Gotta use the photo booth to take some pictures of those black and blues. In this Mac world, you can choose. Hitting Excel to count that paper. Steve Jobs in it for the win, a real money maker. Reinventing social media, centralizing market products, no lies, it's not Wikipedia. Finding the modern medium. That's why when you die, brand loyalty to the death. Flowers on his gravestone, that's how they're treating him. Mac versus PC, no competition iTunes selling tracks, feeding the game, it's a mission. No division, keep it simple as these Mac ads complete the vision. Yeah, complete the vision. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's my younger son. And on that note, that's my middle son. Now, what's really scary, my 13-year-old, who I've been coaching at La Crosse, trying to teach him how to be an Iroquois Indian for the last five years. In California, I started this whole La Crosse thing. We were actually transferring. The major contribution of Western New York to California, chicken wings and La Crosse, Iroquois. Just remember, chicken wings are really big. Do we have time? We have time for Q&A. And we have a, we have, well, we can take a little longer if we have to. I'm good. Q 
Can you let some of them down here? Is there a fire law so we can see who they are? Can we send some Genesee up to those guys or the bats? It's got to be weird being up there, isn't it? We're going to need that, Allie. Good. So what we'd like to do, we would like to entertain some questions for Mr. Bill Cleary. Remember, he is an expert in culture, anthropology, history, technology, and a super marketing guru. So if you'd like to ask a question, Shoot. Allie and I are, go I mean, he's our superstar, Buffalo State grad. We'd like to, uh, Allie will give um, the microphone to the side. Allie, if you could pass that along. And if you could ask the question into the microphone, that would be great. Don't be afraid to answer questions. Ramona. Thank you, Ramona. Hi, I'm, um, I'm Ramona Santamaria, and I am a professor here at Buffalo State, and I'm in the Computer Information Systems Department. Uh, just to clarify Compu who I am. Computer Information Systems Department. OK. So we teach about computers. We don't fix them. Okay. You don't so, do Windows. No, we don't. Um, and the, my question is this. Um, I recently wrote a paper with a colleague of mine on the Mac versus PC commercials, and in the paper, we talked about how there's a huge gender difference in there. How out of 130, I think it was 136 ads, only 22 of them were women, and only of those five, women were placed in, um, what would you say, uh, prominent roles as Are you in, about the I'm a Mac and I'm a PC? Yeah, yeah, what did I well, say? Well, the two main characters are dudes. I know, and so my question is, when we're talking about you know deliberate advertising. We lost, we lost, um, I think they ran for four years, 2004 years. Yeah, I think, I, think years. I think it's a little bit longer. Occasionally they'll pull them out and you'll see them. They're all over the internet, so. Yeah. But we lost. Ads an, today live forever, by the way. Right. Well, we lost an opportunity to kind of bring women into the forefront in an advertising um, campaign. And so I guess my, my but question. But you forgot to analyze the 1984 ad, who was the we hero. Had it in our, we had that in our next, compu um, our next paper, which was right. The Computer Becomes Human. So, <laughs> um, well, and, what's and the, the so question my, quest, is, my question is, can you talk a little bit about the, deliberate, the deliberativeness of being deliberate with advertising in terms of placing, um, to be different, to diversify, but also saying diversification within race, class, and gender? Because okay. we don't really show that as much as we might want to when we're having those powerful messages come out. I'm sorry that was long. Okay, that's a good, that's a good question, and you know, when you, by the time you get into like an advertising or marketing function, a lot of the things that you discuss at universities and even political correctness in general, you have to just dispense with it and you have to in embrace reality, whatever the reality is at any point in time. So if the reality, if the market's being driven by brand specifiers who happen to be male, and that's the case with personal computers. Dudes are out there telling other dudes and telling women what the coolest computers are. So. A lot, of, a lot of the choices are made, and they're very deliberate. Uh, they're made uh, you know, based on the realities that the marketers have to deal with. And they're really, they're colorblind. They're, hey, if they're selling the product to uh, minority people, Hispanic people, it really doesn't matter you know, because they're still selling the product. They're looking at the optimal return on the advertising investment. And they're very pragmatic about the way they approach the ads. I think in that case, it's probably like, hey, there's two guys that are the founders that we base the brand personalities on. The one guy's responsible for all the whole Windows world, and that's Bill Gates. And over here, the guy responsible for the alternative is Steve Jobs. They're both guys. Let's anthropomorphize them, and we'll put this guy. You can't put Steve Jobs in a dress. He won't look good, right? But you put this guy over here, and he's fighting with this person over here. And yeah, it's really, it's kind of gender neutral stuff. But Apple, by the way, just so you know, is probably as a company, there's not a company that promotes women more and is more pro-women than any, in any company in California. A lot of companies say they are. It's like I know guys that are out selling solar, and they wouldn't let a windmill go up across the street, you know, because they're not really proponents. They're selling it or they're talking about it. They're like politicians. They're positioning themselves, but they're not really into it. Apple, Apple does what they say they're going to do, and, and they're taking a lot of heat, especially now. New York journalists and whatnot because of the manufacturing in China. They're, they're, you know, there's a lot of political correctness going on. But the reality is they make great products that are unleashing creativity for millions and millions of people around the world. And that's the bottom line. That's all people care about right Bill, now. Thank you. Bill, we have a question from one of our business students. He's a junior yep. here at Buffalo State. Yeah. Oh. 
Oh. You're uh, a business I, student? Yes, I'm a business student. Um, the question I had was, when, uh, when the company started to fall down and they were noticing that I was going to be bankrupt, was the original plan was to interact more with the youth, as you, um, as you can see now. Like, I think one of the great marketing schemes that they have is how you can buy an iPhone and then all the later versions are toned down where it's like $50 and free and to the point now where it's to the masses where anybody can get one. So, you know, when Steve Jobs came into the, came back in as he had left, was the original plan was to attract the youth more? Because the Macintosh, I know maybe I wasn't born then, but it seemed like it wasn't something that kids <laughs> wanted to use. So, yeah. you know, in, introducing the iPod and think differently was the plan. Well, he was looking, yeah, exactly. He's looking at kids trading up. It hit me. Uh, I was on a subway going from Manhattan up to the Bronx. You know, my uncle, I didn't tell you guys, my uncle started the New York Yankees. And he was a criminal. Um, <laughs> he was a police chief in New York City in 1901 or something. And, and based on the way they used to run things back then, Tammany Hall it was called. Uh, they, indi they indicted the guy once and you know, they had to throw it out because the mayor was crooked, everybody was crooked. And the funny story is that I hadn't been back to Yankee Stadium for a long time and I had this emotional connection to the Yankees even though I hate baseball. Uh, but I wanted to go to a game. I was taking the subway and we were going up northern Manhattan, we were going up through Harlem. And that's when it first hit me that there was a revolution going on with Apple technology because all those kids, those young black kids had iPods, right? And they were listening to music and it had captured. Then I, when I went to on Hollywood about three years ago with all the rappers, and I said, these guys were amazing what they were doing with video, video production, all on Macintosh-based technology. So I think there was an attempt to broaden the base and make it accessible to the masses of people. And that's always been you know, Apple, Apple's mission is to make technology cheap enough, but great technology costs more than Windows, right? It's like, you got a choice. You can eat at McDonald's, you can go to a good restaurant, which isn't McDonald's, right? And it's the same thing. You can buy cheap technology. Windows is pretty cheap. I mean, they're making fun of this stuff, but it's been around forever. MS-DOS, they put graphics on top of that, and it's Windows, and it's really not the solution. It's not like next step or next technology being ported over to the Macintosh. All that technology is now going into all these devices. And it's all, it's all about the digital world out there. So yes, there's an absolute attempt to market these products and get people sampling at a really young age if it's on an iPod, if it's on an iPhone, whatever it is. iPhone's a computer. It's a computer. I mean, everything about it's a computer. And then an iPad, it is a computer. Like I said, it really has replaced my daily computer use. I hope I answered your question. Yes, it's, 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 what, it's an in, intention of the company to make it accessible to the masses. Yeah. Could you give him the mic? It's like oh, that's okay. So, like, the um, I guess when, when uh, Apple was starting to do starting to do very well, um, uh, Jobs hired Gates to be a software engineer. Um, which? Where did you hear that? Uh, I, my, unless correct me if I'm wrong, I believe he did. I've never I've never heard that. Yeah, Gates, Gates came out of Harvard. He's a Harvard dropout. And, right, uh, but he, he was he was starting um, he was starting well Microsoft with, before they were profitable. I'm talking like late 70s, early 80s, and Apple was doing very very well in 82, 83 when they had come out. No, with the, not true. I was at Apple and Gates was ready. Was at Microsoft. He came to our sales meeting in 83. So Gates never worked for Apple. Not to my knowledge. Okay. But um, anyway, uh, why we, would he? We should call him and ask him what's up. Um, use the blue, let's use the blue box and call him. It's free. Um, why, did, why do you think Gates had, uh, or not Gates, uh, why do you think Jobs put uh, Eric Schmidt on the board at, uh, at Apple? I know he's quite upset with Google because of their Android system. Well, they kicked him off the board. Right. They well, left Al Gore on. I could tell um, you some Al Gore of, I guess it was a, the SEC thought it was a conflict of interest, but I was just... To me, it didn't. It seemed logical. Why would you ever let him on the board, Eric Schmidt, on the board? I don't think. I, I think he was. You know, he's he perceived to be a really smart businessman. I'm, the guy I know that's been on the board the longest at Apple was my former boss at Apple. He was the VP of marketing. His name is Bill Campbell. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard that name. Yes. Bill Campbell was instrumental in so many ways at keeping Steve, you know, calm when he, you know, <laughs> you have his moments. He wasn't on his medication or whatever. But he, he, he was a really. Um, Eric Schmidt, you know, the guy's a really smart guy, so they want to have a, a mixed board. They had 
uh, they had a woman astronaut on the board. They had Al Gore's on the board at one time. They had some interesting guys on the board, right? Mm -hmm. um, but Eric, Eric Schmidt's a you know, smart guy. I mean, why he showed up in North Korea, I don't know. You know, I have no idea. Somebody's talking about he, he, him and I mean, why, did, why does the guy go to North Korea to become a diplomat? And he's headed up, headed up Google for so long. He's a really smart guy. He might be a stockholder. Don't ask me why the Apple Thank stock you. is dropping. I have no yeah. idea. Look at that. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from, we're going to take a question from, from one of our hospitality and tourism students right oh. here. I got some questions for you back. Hi. Um, I want you to call the mansion. I want more mints. <laughs> okay. My question is that if the idea that make message is so simple and powerful, that idea is so successful, why would the other company use it? Like, it's so hard to for you to see those other companies like Apple. They make their products so simple, even the commercial. Why wouldn't those companies? Be because do that? one of the problems is that that there's there's a real uh, science to marketing, but there's also an art. And it's kind of like, I know a lot of CEOs and I've been to their homes, and I don't know, the, the carpets don't always match the drapes, you know? They're not always astute in creative issues. So um, you have a CEO that's not necessarily the most creative guy in the world, and maybe he's got an MBA from Wharton, but you know, you, you go into his house and you go, wow, that guy's in charge of all the branding and marketing for this company. So it's a challenge, you know, and I think the best thing you can do, I used to, one of the challenges, one of the things we used to do really well at CKS, we were known as being the most abrasively honest agency in the history of advertising because we would, we would never BS. We'd go in there and say, that's a stupid idea. And people never fired us when we told them the truth. Your baby is ugly. You're not gonna, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So the, the, a lot of CEOs are just not skilled. And you go in there and you can have a meeting with a guy and say, you know what? You should do this, and you should simplify your message, and you should do that, and that, and you go through the whole list of things, and then they'll go ahead and they'll do whatever they want to do, because they don't take you that seriously. One of the problems is they don't believe this stuff really makes a difference, and unless you can get them to sit down for three or four hours and spend quality time with them, go through a presentation like the history of Apple or something, where they get to see, you know, results that they can evaluate and say, you know, that really does work, but that's hard to do, and I had that. The pleasure of doing that for companies like National Semiconductor, Tektronics, we, our company in general, eBay, we put back on. You know, eBay wanted to come out initially, and they wanted to do all these weird ads. They hired an ad agency in New York, and these guys wanted to sell ads and put them on TV. I said, that's not what eBay's about. You guys are really about lots of little subcultures, guys that collect junk. You're like the world's biggest swap meet. You know, you're a digital swap meet. Let's be honest. If you start doing those big ads, you're going to lose cred. You're going to lose street cred. People are, you're going to piss off people. Keep it simple. And then, you know, Meg Whitman left. I was out of the loop on eBay for a decade, and all of a sudden I start seeing ads. Somebody in New York did like show tunes, like they're singing. We did it eBay way or something. It was ridiculous because the reason eBay was successful is they had the most sellers and they had the most buyers, and one drove the other. And it was real simple. They, were the, they had the, what they call the first mover advantage, and that's why they were successful. It's real simple. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Hi, Mr. Clear. My name is Kathy. I'm a business major. Um, I enjoyed the presentation. Uh, my question is, I understand that Stephen Jobs was an innovator and a genius and came up with a lot of great ideas for Apple. However, the rumors were, and I don't know if it was prior to his death, that a lot of the inventions that he came up with were either taken from the employees that were working with them or that... Well, that was their job. So... But did you, did you're, you're being truthful. Here's the deal. The mouse was the first really smart way to interact with a computer. Before that, you had to type in all these cryptic commands. Like with the Apple II, and I hate to admit this, Jobs was right. He said, it's Jobs, when I was at the Apple II, I had a billion dollar division. I had a $62 million budget. And Jobs would go to telepress. That thing's a piece of crap. Wait till the Mac comes out next year. Don't buy that. Not realizing that his company would be out of business if he kept talking like that. It's one of the reasons he got fired. But it's true. The mouse. And the Macintosh is based on a product called the Lisa that my same neighbor that runs education, John Couch, developed the Lisa. And the Lisa, which is Steve Jobs' illegitimate daughter, uh, the Lisa is also based on the Xerox Star. Given an infinity, Xerox, a company you know and love here in Western New York, they were never going to implement it. They created, at Xerox Park in Western, in up, and actually near Palo Alto in California, they created all this great technology and they set on it. 
So Steve Jobs saw the mouse and he did copy the mouse. The employees internally, one of their jobs is to create innovative products. They're getting paid a lot of money. Some of these engineer, engineers are making three, four hundred thousand dollars a year to head up a team to develop things. So they get paid fairly good, they, real great compensation. Some engineers, the guys that rolled out the Mac, guys like, um, guys that I actually knew, became multimillionaires because they worked their tails off and they got extra stock. That's the compensation package. So the answer is yes and no. I mean, the, the employees are being paid, it's a business, to develop innovative products. The copying of other people's ideas, if somebody has a good idea, you innovate, but they didn't copy the Xerox star, they got the idea of the mouse. They, this little device, a pointing device, where you have pull down menus and you can select something. Instead of going, you know, command L to load up a file or command P to print a document, right? All you gotta do is pull down the menu and hit, P, hit print and you can see it there. That's all it is. What they're working on now, you know what it is, voice, right? So you can't say they're stealing that from somebody else. Everybody's working on voice. Everybody's working on uh, uh, artificial intelligence. It's all happening in real time. Yeah. Ellie, you have something? I hope I answered your question. Okay. Hi, I just had a different type of questions related to it. Steve Jobs was known for believing in the importance of um, interactive and creativity, so building the buildings in Cupertino to make sure that you're fostering communication. I was thinking about Yahoo. You had said you'd worked with Yahoo. The change in the work at home policy, what do you think um, about that change in business? It's not politically correct, but I'm saying she's right, and the reason Mayor's right is because you've got to get people on campus because it is a collaborative effort. And because a lot of people, it's been proven they work at home. I mean, I did, I worked at home. You know, the dog barks, the neighbor's lawnmower, it's hard, especially if you're doing really tough work. And you need to meet with your colleagues, you need to be interacting. I'd say they should loosen up and maybe let the people work home one or two days a, a week. But for the most part, I don't think it's a bad policy to get people to work. I mean, we live in a real soft country now. Most parts of the world, uh, boy, that's, a, that's the least on the complaint, that's the lowest thing on the complaint list. I, I can't work, I have to go to work every day. <laughs> As opposed to, uh, I'm staying at home, I think I'm gonna take a nap. I know myself, I'd be doing, ah, oh, what time? Hmm, one o'clock, I, <laughs> I gotta take my power nap. before. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, 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 look, I've been living at home for 20 years, it's not easy concentrating. I used to <laughs> just keep an office so I could do my, you know, my, my, the work I was doing. So it's, it's, it's hard. So I understand, and I understand the reaction. It affects women more than men, apparently. But the fact is, it's better to get people at work. Maybe change it around, you know, have more daycare, if that's the issue, on site. You know, have more daycare. Have more support for those people. If they're valuable employees, and you, and you do want to keep them there. But you've got to be at, at work to get the work done. Short term, yes. Short term, yes, because we live in a society where, where those political issues pop up and it can denigrate a brand. But also, over time, it, what will determine their fate is their performance. I think Yahoo's problems are far bigger than whether or not you have a work at home policy. I think Google's just eating their lunch. And the reason is because they kept it simple. Their communications are simple. Their advertising model's simpler. You know? I, we know Jerry Yang, and we actually, they, wanted to, they had a crazy name for the company. He said, well, why, you know, why don't we just call it Yahoo? You guys are Yahoo, we'll call it Yahoo. It's a good computer company name. Bill, we have a question, excuse me, a question from an English education major here at Buffalo State College. Oh, English education. Mm -hmm. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm wondering if you think that- You don't have an English accent. <laughs> I was How actually you born be in, in English Slovakia. Education? But, huh? um, do you think that education has been or can it be branded, and if so, how? Well, that's a big question. That's a, that's a difficult question to answer. And the answer is anything can be branded, okay? Um, if you can take uh, the Marlboro Man as a mnemonic device, right, and take cigarettes and make them attractive to people, uh, even though they're coughing up some strange stuff, and they continue to do it, and it's really hard, you gotta, you gotta put you know, hazard, uh, hazard notices on the side of the packs, you can brand anything. But the problem with branding education is education is, falling behind the harsh realities of our culture. There are issues out there like global warming. There are issues out there. I mean, there are political issues. You know, political parties, to me, are anachronistic. I mean, they, that's why nothing gets done in Washington. I, I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. You know, I, I'd rather be a Unitarian, you know, and 
uh, I wouldn't even go. I mean, people call me up now, and I give them a hard time. I don't care who they are if they call me up and ask me for money. I go, I'm not going to support you guys. You don't get anything. What did you do last week? And so the answer is, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question completely. But I, I really think um, in terms of, um, yeah, I, I don't know how to answer that. You know, I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah. For sure, Dave. Hey, I have a quick question. Uh, basically, because of convergence and uh, the separation of traditional media and new media, uh, social media would be called king nowadays. Yeah. Based on all these different social uh, media websites that are collecting information from people, algorithms, and basically a way to reach an audience and be able to engage them and sell a product, which social network, in your opinion, is the most effective? Well, right now it has to be Facebook, right? Because that's the, the, you know, of all the social networks. But I got to tell you, that's not new. I was the chairman of the board in 1998 after I left uh, Clary Kwame and Suter. I joined and became the chairman of the board of a company called Matchmaker.com, where I did um, <laughs> online dating. I didn't do any of the dating, but I, I was the chairman of the board. We used to meet in Texas, which was a scary thing for me. Beside the humidity, the people were scary. They had guns on their cars. And uh, I, have to, I have to tell you, the, the, um, back then, that was the beginning. Actually, eBay was the first social network, because people were aggregating around selling certain junk in the garage. So I, I collect Pez dispensers. The original thing for, for, for the guys at eBay were Pez dispensers. That's where they started that business, right? And then after that, guys that collect toy soldiers. They knew I collected, I collect toy soldiers. They knew I collected them. They used to come to my house and beg me to take them on. My partners didn't want to take on eBay. They go, these guys are a bunch of jerks. I go, they're going to be real successful because people have a lot of junk they want to sell. And their business model just kicks butt. But that's social networks. So people, when, they, when people say, well, look, we do, now we have uh, eBay and we have all these different things now, and uh, the, the, I mean, uh, not eBay, but um, you know, Facebook, and all of this stuff has, has come in the last you know, less, less than six years, seven years, and it's all really viable. The problem I have with Facebook, I don't know, sometimes I think it's just a place where narcissists can go and post pictures of um, their sister. I don't know. Oh, definitely. Uh, have you ever looked into Google AdWords or like yeah. you think that YouTube is on the rise for this type of thing? Yeah, I think, I think Google's on the rise for this kind of thing. I think there are really cool things you can do with social media, but I don't think it's a replacement for advertising. I think it's a, re I think it's a replacement for PR because I think you can, I think a good, now getting back to our English major, a good storyteller is always a good storyteller. I believe that English majors that can communicate effectively will have better job prospects than attorneys in a decade. There's too many attorneys, and most of the things they do can be replaced. Is there any attorneys, by the way, in this room? <laughs> well, dude, most of what you do can be replaced with a computer, you know, legal Zoom. <laughs> but jo those sort of linear jobs, accounting positions, a lot of that stuff's going to be replaced. So if somebody has a good yarn to spin and tell a tale, that's what companies are going to be hiring. Not, the attorneys will always be around. We need them for government. But Seven out of 10 people in Washington now are attorneys, which I was really impressed with that figure. But the fact is that most of the people that are going into this work today, they're creative people. A lot of these people come from all backgrounds, mostly general liberal arts backgrounds, and, and, or no college at all, and they're doing really well. And they're changing the planet. Yeah. Hey, Bill, we're gonna take one more question. Sure. Okay, all right. Um, I, wait a minute, we have, uh, you had a question too. Right, we have w one woman and one man. One more, two questions left. So if you can get the mic to this, is, do we have a gentleman here? Hello, um, that's loud. Uh, my Hello. question's from an advertising standpoint. Yeah. What do you think of Apple's stance on jailbreaking their phones and do you think it'll hurt them in the long run because of uh, an inaccessibility for the users to create more content and use their phones? And oh, you mean actually, uh, well, I'm gonna tell you, you know the guy I showed you before, Wozniak? He is a really, he's probably the, the nicest human being you'll ever meet. I mean, he's given s tens of millions of dollars away uh, to mu his museum and stuff there. And he's been, always been a major proponent. This is where he and Jobs disagreed. He believed, the Apple II originally had all these open slots. And Steve goes, why are you keeping all these open slots? He goes, well, I want my friends to develop products that they can put inside my box here. And they can make a buck too. And so there's a culture out there um, and it, they used to be called, those guys were called the homebrew club and they'd get together and it, you know, it was all collaborative. These guys were all engineering, techie-oriented techie guys and they would share ideas. It's kind of like uh, Paul Smith. Imagine a whole club of guys like Paul Smith. 
Paul Smith was a guy at Lakeshore High School that was this, he looked like a special needs student, but he was really quite smart. He had a very long Gumby type head. You know, I don't know, what was he doing now? He said, you gotta take him, you should have brought him here tonight. Anyway, yep. those, 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 kinds of, those kinds of things, um, you know, I, I, I really believe that you should open up things and let people kind of break into your gear, except the Chinese. I don't want them coming in and breaking into all our companies uh, through, <laughs> through cyber espionage. But for the rest of them, I mean, open stuff up, let people come in, let them mess around with it, because I think there is added value they can provide. You know, how many have ever heard of this guy, John McAfee? John McAfee, the guy they were chasing down in Central America, the criminal, or whatever, they said he murdered his neighbor or something. I met that guy, and he came into our office because he wanted us to do his marketing. I didn't want to work with him. He was dressed in leather from head to toe, and it was all studded. And he was the guy that developed McAfee uh, software to, for, for protection from break-ins and stuff. And I said, that guy's doing the bugs. He's the hacker, and then he's come on up, coming up with the solutions. <laughs> Turned out, I, and a lot of people believe this to this day in Silicon Valley. So some guys are good. You don't want them breaking into your gear, but some, you know, some guys. I mean, you know, some guys you don't want to break into your gear. Some guys, it's less of a problem. Okay, we had one more question. One more question here, Bill. I'm a professor here, but also in the creative studies, working on a, to open up my own creativity. Can you summarize or just give us a picture of how creativity has changed what what Apple was like, or how define how creativity used within this company? How, how it's used today? Yes. Whoa. Um, see, I'm not necessarily privy to that other than the guys I know that work for the company. And most of the guys that works at Apple? Uh, the people in creative services, a lot of them come out of RISD if they're, you know, designers or uh, Rhode Island School of Design or uh, the, arts, the Arts Center down in Pasadena, California. But what, they all smoke a little doobie. Uh, <laughs> well, that's California, and, <laughs> and when they come to work, you can smell it, and, uh, huh? Are you from California? Where are you from? Oh, you're from Torrance, so you smoked a lot more doobie than we do. <laughs> yeah, that, you had that bad boy stuff down there. Because <laughs> the stuff we have makes you hungry, the stuff down there makes you nap. That's another reason why they shut down, uh, you know, <laughs> A lot of that going on and too much napping. Um, wow, I'd say, I'd say the creative people, the typical creative people at Apple today, the ones that were there when Jobs was still alive, I can tell you, had thick hides and they were persistent and, and tenacious and they stuck to their guns and they argued with them and they fought with them and they got the right things through. Because remember, there were times he could be an arrogant SOB and a typical CEO thinks he knows everything and that's a danger. But it, when he was surrounded with really smart people who would challenge him, like Lee Clow or Steve Hayden, who was a copywriter from Shire Day and now basically is the chairman of the board for BBDO. No, is it? No, she, what is it? Company, Ogilvy. He's here in New York. Uh, or my old business partner, Tom Suter, who Steve really respected. I mean, be, the two days before he died, he called him up and told him, hey, I think I'm going to be checking out soon. I mean, that's how close those guys were. So, um, yeah, I, I think. I really think um, the creative people at Apple are still, you know, really risk-taking. You know, just some of them are just, you know, the basically get the books out, get the website published, whatever you're doing. But some of them are really still very innovative. The most innovative people are still on, out in the agency business, though. Guys that try it day. Guys like Lee Clow. Lee Clow, when I met him, looked like uh, and this is in the '80s. He, he was a guy who was surfing down in Venice when I met him. His hair was like down here, and he has a beard, and he looked like an 80-year-old man. Well, he looks the same today, he's like 80 year, but he is 80, and <laughs> probably. But he's a very cool guy, and he, he was, uh, yeah, you know, he's like one of those guys from California, and, you know, I'm working on a big ad for Steve. I hope he digs it. You know, that's the, and so that was the creative guy, you know? It's like, yeah, it's too bitching. It's really nice. And that's the way the guys communicated. And St Steve would go, what's up, Steve? You know, what's up to, to Lee? And he, he basically, he delivered that message. So yeah, they're very clever, they're very creative. Look at the work. But the, again, Jobs, his bias was toward being minimalist, keep it simple, don't over-communicate. You know, probably he'd criticize my presentation tonight because I probably over-communicated and talked too much because I haven't had enough sleep. Came here at four in the morning my time. Anyway, so that's the thing. Okay?
That was great, Bill Cleary. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Outstanding.